Good evening and welcome to today's Asset Colloquium. So just a few weeks ago, we had a talk of one of our former colleague uh, uh, going up to the base uh, camp of Himalayas, uh, Everest rather. And uh, today we have uh, a talk, of course, on a more of a technical level, talking about the making of Himalayas and which is in some sense uh, a continuous process. So welcome today to Dr. Vinod Garg. Um, who is going to uh, give today's colloquium. And I want to also welcome on behalf of the director TIFR, Professor Jairam Chenglur, uh, who couldn't be here today, here to uh, travel to our uh, TIFR Hyderabad Center, and also all of us at TIFR. And I also would like to thank Professor uh, Vivek Dathar, who was actually the person responsible for having this talk here today. So without taking both of that time, let me invite uh, Professor Datta to formally introduce today's speaker and conduct the rest of the proceedings. Okay, so let me first of all thank uh, Professor Vinod Gaud for accepting this invitation. He's one of the you know, most eminent uh, geophysicists, uh, cosmologists, and uh, he's worked also on other areas of physics. Uh, he's been a doyen of this these fields uh, uh, to deliver this asset collection. So he, uh, let me give you a little short background. He studied earth physics at the Banaras Hindu University and uh, the, the undergraduation. And then he did a PhD in Imperial College London. Uh, subsequent to that, he went to uh, Sorbonne, Paris, and then joined the uh, UK uh, National Physical Laboratory. Uh, which our national physical and it's probably modeled on that. Uh, he then uh, joined the University of Rootki, which is now the IIT Rootki, and started this uh, the academic program there in this area. Uh, he was there for quite a few years, I think 15, 20 years or something. Uh, after which he went, uh, he became the director of the Geophysical Research Institute, National Geophysical Institute at uh, Hyderabad. Uh, later, he became the secretary to the Department of Ocean Development. Uh, before going to uh, Bangalore, where he was at the uh, the presently present name is the CSIR Fourth Paradigm Institute. He is uh, currently there as an honorary emeritus scientist. Uh, he is also associated. He told me that with the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, so he's kind of uh, has his people both sides. Uh, he's uh, well known in at least in the. Uh, media maybe, uh, for his prediction of the April 2015 uh, big earthquake in Nepal. Uh, his scientific contributions are many and he has listed some of them which you might have already seen in the abstract. But uh, I will just mention a few, this is not to take that much time, namely the tectonics of the Himalayan region. So probably both the upward movement as well as the uh, longitudinal movement of the uh, Indian plate into the Eurasian plate. Uh, he also set up this uh, experiment or, or laboratory to measure very accurately the carbon content in the atmosphere. And uh, so the carbon dioxide measurements were done in the Himalayan region in Ladakh. I don't know exactly the place, probably Hanle or somewhere nearby. Um, so there is an observatory which he has set up uh, in Ladakh called the Indian Astronomical Observatory there. His current interests include uh, uh, developing methods to uh, uh, quantify the properties of materials under high temperature and pressure. Uh, I mean, uh, things that exist at the core of the earth, so as to model uh, the normal modes of uh, the earth and so on. Um, so he is, of course, uh, a very well decorated person. He's a member of all three academies and the uh, what is that? Uh, the wow, the, it's called now the D World Science Academy. Uh, also, a uh, winner of the uh, Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award, uh, and uh, he's given uh, many INSA lecture awards, uh, which include many lectures. Uh, in 2014, he was given the Lifetime Award by the Ministry of Earth Sciences, the Government of India. And of course, he has a uh, some uh, DSS from uh, BHU, Andhra, and so on, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru Technical University. So, with this uh, brief introduction, uh, we're very happy to welcome Professor Gaur to give this colloquium. Uh, thank you. And please.
Thank you very much indeed for asking me to, to be here to talk about the Himalaya kind of landform with which I've been fascinated for a very long period in my life. They continue to be built by the action of this uh, unique planetary thermodynamic engine, which is powered by the Earth's heat. And it's very easily the most dramatic landform on the surface of the Earth. As the planet itself is, that you can see, easily distinguishable from its siblings in the solar family, from the beautiful hues reflected from its clouds, deserts, and the many splendor crops and forests. Uh, and how did all this come to happen? Only on Earth and not on other planets has always intrigued uh, many scientists, certainly me. So this is the context of the Earth. But as a scientist, one would naturally begin to ask, well, why didn't it happen on other planets? And what was the reason that it only happened here? And what are those circumstances? Because it's very closely connected with the development of life on Earth and consciousness and opportunities like this that came into being. Interiors of all protoplanets heated up as they formed. Now it is, this is the standard accepted theory that the planets evolved by the aggregation of planetesimals, which came with a lot of uh, their uh, kinetic energy, and that was blanketed, you know, at times of uh, very heavy showers. And that energy was buried. Also, as the planet compressed under gravity, converted the potential energy into heat. And of course, there is radioactivity, which is constantly producing uh, heat energy. So all planets have hot interiors. And at least the four planets um, close to the sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, have almost the same genetic material, the same chemical composition, which eventually results in a certain kind of uh, evolutionary trajectory. So how come it didn't happen? And uh, uh, these processes, of course, they molten the planet at some stage because of this uh, compression of uh, compression energy and so forth around four and a half year uh, annum ago. And that facilitated the density and rheology uh, fractionation in the Earth because higher density materials just started falling to the center. Uh, particularly iron, nickel, and such like things, and uh, forcing the lighter material to go up. That also produced uh, heat because the heavier material coming down and the lighter one going up left a difference of the potential energy, which eventually appeared as heat. So there were all these sources, and the Earth got differentiated under gravity. And as it differentiated, because there was a thermal regime also built up by the temperature gradient between what was happening at the center to the seat of more energy, heat energy, and the surface, um, which is in contact with a much colder space. Uh, there, there was this thermal gradient, and there was a heat flow. And how the heat flows is very important. Apparently, that uh, assumed a crucial significance in the evolution of the Earth itself. I mean, we know what are the various ways through which uh, heat is transferred. You have conduction and convection and advection and all these processes occur, but how will they occur will be determined on material properties, densities, and the thermal gradient. And somehow the right conditions um, constellated to form this Goldilocks planet that we live on. So you can see the all planets of this hot interior. This is, Mar this is Mercury closest to the sun, and it has a much larger core in proportion to its size. Um, uh, and, uh, it is, and of course, there is, there is convection in this core because that's a liquid core, and there's a weak magnetic field which is associated with that convection. This is the Earth um, in which the 
all three modes of heat transfer take place. So how planets outflow heat determines their, their evolutionary tra tra trajectory. And uh, amazingly, this is critically dependent on whether they hold liquid water or not. So that's the key, it turns out, which uh, many formulations and modeling exercises have revealed. <clears throat> and this picture shows that one can work out, given the size of his star and its luminosity, as to what would be the radius of the habitable zone around it. I think it is primarily determined by uh, the, the nearer limit, by the radiation intensity that will not drive away, that will not dissociate water. Because once water gets dissociated, then hydrogen, which is very light, has an escape velocity. You know, its average kinetic energy has an escape velocity, which is larger than what the gravity will allow, and it will escape the space. And the outer is uh, broadly determined by the freezing point of carbon dioxide. So there's a very uh, narrow margin in the space, which is habitable, and it is, calculate, it is calculable because one can measure the intensity of radiation, uh, just in my square law will give it. And one knows roughly, so what is the intensity of radiation uh, that, that will dissociate water. So one can see how the Earth um, was spaced in a very convenient place, in a, in a place where the water will not only exist in the liquid state, but in all three phases. And that's a very important factor because the conversion of, of one phase to another involves a transaction of very large amounts of energy because water has also very high specific heat and latent heat. And that is responsible to a very large extent into the dramatic processes that only happen on planet Earth. <clears throat> so what is the composition that uh, planet Earth eventually acquired? Um, a core here in the middle, which is solid, surrounded by liquid core, and why should that happen? How come a solid core should uh, exist there? And that happens because the material undergoes phase change due to very high temperatures and pressures of, uh, of uh, you know, many uh, hundreds of megapascals. And it so happens that at this point over here, the geotherm, the temperature curve from the surface down to the core. And since temperature is a continuous function all, all along, it is a continuous curve. But at certain pressures and temperature, there are phase changes, which are discontinuous. And whenever the melting point becomes higher or lower than the ambient temperature over there, will determine as to whether it will stay in the solid phase or liquid phase. And it so happens that this part becomes solid and that part becomes liquid and then solid again, which is mantle. Very fortuitous because you need this kind of analyst to run convection. And if that were not there, there would be no magnetic field. And the protection that we have on account of the magnetic field from the deadly radiation of the sun would probably not have allowed life to exist. So one can see how fortuitous everything has been. Uh, just to convince you that this is not a fanciful picture, but something which has been uh, determined with rigorous science, uh, I must show you that it uses the same kind of formalism to get this structure as the CAT scan. Except that in CAT scanning, we use X-rays, and here we use seismic rays. Seismic rays can also be located. Um, they can be traced from their origin because the earthquakes can be located through various other means, which is uh, school physics. And it is that which tells us as to how these materials are, but in very broadly, but still a little short in definition to let us determine the exact thermodynamic uh, 
sort of uh, behavior of the system. And that is something, you know, which still is a dream. It is our dream, and uh, it would be nice if we were able to do that. <clears throat> In the post-war years, when a lot of ships uh, became available, scientists were able to get it, get these from the government, you know, in order to run their own experiments, run magnetometers in the in toy to, to by seismometers, and also use the 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 magnetometers which were developed for detecting submarines to measure the Earth's gravitational field in greater detail. And there were a couple of very important findings that emerged, um, which came as a surprise and initially difficult to explain. And what was that fossil magnetization, which was trapped in rocks of dateable ages, they required that the Earth had flipped its magnetic poles. And if one looks at the lava flows, and there are many around here, some of you might have observed it, basalt, which is black, uh, black rock on account of uh, abundance of uh, the element magnetite in it. And this actually is the solid form uh, which, which came out of a liquid magma that, that came from inside. But before it solidified from below its, from its square theory point, it got magnetized in the ambient direction of the magnetic field. And what you see here that as different streams of lava flowed, they got magnetized in different directions depending on the epoch because this whole material that you see covered here at places as thick as about two kilometers uh, took about a million years to acquire this. It came in phases. And as they came and the magnetic field of the earth flipped in between, they got branded with these different directions. And this fortuitous, uh, uh, finding happened because of those uh, instruments that had been developed for war purposes and had been made available because the war had ended, such as the sociological consequences of, of science. And the second was that the magnetometers stored by the ship showed that as one sailed, for example, from, from here to in Africa to South America, one would encounter Normally, that is today's magnetic field, and reversely magnetizes chips of rocks, almost symmetrically is spreading across the street. So these two evidences, these two observations put together, made a suggestion that maybe you know there's something happening over here, which brings the material from the earth, as shown here, magma, it cools, breaks a strip. First, it comes and rifts a continent into two pieces. And that is why, you know, when they go apart, their edges will be congruent. And as it cools and expands, various different phases of magma that come out, they get branded by the prevailing magnetic field, and you get these stripes. I must pause here to mention that all this happened because in the meantime, in the post-war years, there were two nuclear physicists of Rutherford, physicists, because what I'm going to tell you is that it was all driven by physicists, not by geologists. Geologists added a lot of detail. And these two physicists, PMS Blackett and Sir Edward Bullard, made remarkable contributions to this. PMS Blackett had designed a magnetometer to test his theory that magnetism was an intrinsic part of a rotating mass because there were certain uh, star systems that actually showed their angular momentum uh, to have to bear a certain particular ratio with their magnetic field. And this was uh, tested for a couple of star systems that were known and he, he hypothesized that this is so, but like a true scientist who doesn't only stop at hypothesis but must test it. He designed an experiment, a torsion magnetometer test the system, but there were no magnetometers available at that time, this was 1950s, when this could be done. So he designed his own aesthetic magnetometer where he put two magnetic bars separated by a certain distance so that you can imagine that in a very crude way, you know, the equivalent magnetic uh, magnetization of this will be very close to zero. And if you made a vibration magnetometer all together, 
its period will be very large. Therefore, it's very high sensitivity, which has made all this possible. So you see how physicists have contributed to this uh, thing. And there is a third path-breaking result, which <clears throat> was used by Bullard, Rutherford's other nuclear physicists, who argued that if you look at South America and uh, Africa, they fit into each other like a jigsaw puzzle in the rest of the world too. And this was suggested by Alfred Wegener in 1920s, but it was viciously attacked on the ground that, do you mean to say that the continents have plowed through the ocean to get apart? And of course, there was no physics to prove this, that they could have done so. And the, the whole idea was abandoned. What Bullard did was, he just tried to move these two to approach each other. But in the spirit of a true scientist, he did it strictly according to the Euler's theorem, which says that any motion on a surface which is spherical is going to be constrained in such a manner that irrespective of the, of the way the motion is being carried, it can be described by rotation about a pole which passes the center. So just one angle will define the entire process. And he calculated as to how these two continents can be brought together. He didn't make any statement that they had, uh, they had been together and rifted apart because there was no way to explain as to how they could have been rifted apart. And that was the main objection to Wagner's theory. But this was a seminal contribution which showed how, how good the fit was. And this is not only for these two continents, but elsewhere on the globe. And this could not have been a purely fortuitous event. So this existed, and it was done with a rigorous mathematical analysis on the basis of Euler's theorem. <clears throat> and this hypothesis then was putting all these facts together, was put forward by, by other people, Mackenzie and from Cambridge and Parker uh, in San Diego. Somewhere. And what it says is that the Earth's heat actually heats up the material qualitatively, much like what would happen to a liquid in a beaker if you heat it from below. The heat will be conducted at first, but if you increase the flame, then eventually it is going to form a structure. And we know characteristic structures like this form in all these systems which are far from equilibrium. Um, because uh, heat has to be, it cannot be, all the heat that is being generated cannot be conducted away. Uh, the conductivity is not just high enough to allow that. And, and, and uh, therefore, it is convected, and when it comes below this surface, at a certain distance, certain depth, then it has to spread, because there's a lid there which must necessarily be cold facing this space. Of course, one can always find as to what is the equilibrium temperature of this just by equating the heat that comes from the sun and that which the planet can radiate at temperature Te, which may be an unknown T to the power four, and you can calculate Te. So Te is known, and this is what would happen. As the material comes up, it will break through this uh, continent, rifting them apart, creating a chasm in between, which will be filled with new waves of material. And this spreading process will acquire momentum because the material that is coming up is slightly denser than the material of the continents that it had drifted, which are more like flotsam. They are successive waves of low density material which being skimmed off uh, the earth. So that is how this, this will go on. But of course, the earth's surface is uh, is not changing that fast. And therefore, as this ocean, the new ocean flow expand, they are going to compress the material on the other side. And it is that kind of compression which will make one go under the other or crumple or do whatever, but in the process always shorten. And shortening, because the mass has to be conserved, will lead to thickening. And that is how uh, Tibet got thickened first, 
it to, to form a buttress uh, for the Himalaya to grow. So this is the plate tectonic theory. And, and because at places material will be rising to form oceans, at others they will be crumpling and probably sinking of some part of the much older oceans which have become in the meantime thicker and colder and heavier and will be recycled back into the mantle. The, the lid, which is rigid, about 70 kilometers thick, uh, can only be fractured. It cannot be deformed in any other way. It is elastic. And by virtue of that, this lid would have, would, would uh, occupy the surface of the earth as a series of jigsaw puzzles of different shapes intervened by chasms through which uh, new materials are coming to form new ocean flows. So that's the basic theory, these are the basic uh, mechanism through which it was proposed that the earth transfers its heat uh, from, from the interior to the surface. And there have been many efforts uh, to glean any symptom of such a plate tectonic process occurring on Mars or Venus, since the uh, Venus and Mars probes have been put over there. And if there were such, one would be able to, one should be able to, um, to identify it by either asking that, well, if this is happening, then these masses moving one from the other all the time, reconfiguring the geography of the Earth's service all the time, should be visible in some form as some kind of patterns. And, uh, and other telltale evidences, you know, which, which were looked for. But it was found that, I mean, so far, no evidence of plate tectonics, this way of, of transferring the heat to the surface has been found to occur uh, on any other planets. So how does it occur on other planets? For example, in Mars, what happened that the cooling took place very fast and the outer lid became, became thick much faster. Then there was enough heat to well up the material, go and lift it up. As a result of which this became so thick that it could not be broken into shells, spherical shells, which will accommodate new coming, upcoming magma. And because of that, the heat can only be conducted, either conducted, or if it builds to uh, a kind of a intensity that it cannot stay there, but must melt the material, bubble them up, it rises and forms volcanoes. And because it is, those plates are not moving, those, the same volcano will go on erupting again and again. And that is why we have the solar, Earth, solar system's highest volcano on Mars. 21 kilometer high. On Earth, the highest we have is eight. And we'll see in a minute why, what limits the height of mountains. So it's a very curious uh, amalgam of all these endowments of the Earth that made liquid water possible. And something else that I didn't mention, the sequence of events, because the liquid water is actually held in the crystalline structure of the of the materials of composition. We call them hydrated minerals. And they will be released like a potter's uh, clay when the kiln is fired just to the right uh, temperature. On Earth, what happened was that the inert gases like neon, argon, and all that started coming earlier, nitrogen, uh, and for, uh, form a kind of an atmosphere. And therefore, they, uh, before the kiln was fired, Therefore, the atmosphere will already be in place before the steaming waters come out of the kiln so that the atmosphere will quench them into rains and form the oceans. What happened on Mars was not this sequence. And therefore, when the kiln was fired there and the waters came out, they were dissociated by sun's rays and hydrogen escaped into space. And there was no atmosphere there to do this. So, the right mass with its right proportion of inherited radiogenic material, which will produce heat 
in the right sequence. All this seems like a fairy tale, uh, which eventually made life possible on this earth. Now, scientists cannot rest by just giving a qualitative picture of what happens. They must put all the statements to test. Otherwise, it remains a folklore. So how do we put it to test? So here are some things that I'm going to, to show to you, the test of the theory. Euler's theorem uh, ordained that if you have a brittle shell here, a shell, thin shell of material which is brittle, which, which can only fracture, and you move it, move it about on Earth, you can only move it in a certain way because the constraints of the surface, that's the Euler's theorem, then if it breaks because of this hot sheets of magma rising up and drifting, it is going to move those in such a manner that the, the fracture, because everything is not uniform, you know, this not a straight line or completely sort of uh, parallel to these, uh, because the material is heterogeneous at most, even the coordinates are heterogeneous. And uh, uh, a smooth fracture will not happen, but it will jagged. But if they're jagged, then they have to be offset. And the offsets will always be parallel to the direction of motion of this. So and these offsets can actually be seen if you take uh, echo images of the Earth's base of flow, which was done. And that echo image is this exact image. This is not, this is not a, an artist's description. This is an exact image of the ocean floor. And it shows you that these fracture systems, if you, if you, if you take the uh, perpendicular bisectors, which are done here, they all intersect at that point. That's the Euler's point. So, so this is not fanciful. They have rotated. This is the only way they could rotate on the surface of the Earth. And, and here is the Euler's pole, QED, because, so this, this is the, so you predict as to what could be the consequences of that particular motion and then test it with theory. So this was one test and there were relentless such tests uh, by the demand of the, of the scientific method to, to go on uh, looking for more such tests because because of the non popperian if I may use the word, credentials of confirmatory tests. Uh, Popper, the philosopher, says that a million confirmation uh, will not refute a theory. It's only yet another failure at refutation. So he insisted that unless you can find uh, a test which should happen, and you refute it by observation. You cannot say that that theory is final. It can only remain a part of the evolutionary mark theoretical improvements. So one must persevere and find more. And here's another one. And by this time, uh, it's amazing because uh, in the Western world, somehow, you know, scientists have been able to come together. A lot of physicists came together and uh, started looking at quantitative approaches to doing uh, the physics of the earth. And what emerged during that period, that very period of uh, late 60s, early 70s is that looking at the seismic waves, they could work out as to what must have been the rupture direction of the rocks that produced this earthquake. And when those rupture directions were plotted, this is what emerged, that at these points, all along the Atlantic Ridge, the rupture directions pull apart. This is how the fracture are taking place. And that is how it should be if they are being really pushed apart by the ascending uh, strips of magma. On the other hand, because at these edges, the continents are being pushed, and the ocean flow here is pushing against the continent, the mechanism should be completely different. Should ocean flows are slightly heavier, they dive beneath the continent. So it's going like this. The slip should be this for you. It's exactly that. So here is another test of the theory from earthquake mechanisms and their solutions that the stress field is indeed exactly what that theory presents in this kind of a geography. And another one that 
the ocean floors as they spread. At the other end, they are cooling and becoming aged, more aged, and denser, thicker, and eventually they are going to die. Firstly, because by compressing the continents on the other side, they are producing potential energy by raising mountains there or, or raising the elevation of the, of, the, of the landform. And that potential energy will eventually checkmate it at the stake. And when it begins to checkmate, what can happen? The denser material will go down. And the oceans dive at the edges of the continent, which were once lifted and where that ocean was born. Fantastic story. But that also means that as we go away from the center, the age of the ocean should change. And it cannot be as hoary as those of the continents, which are flotsam, which are light density material, which are unsinkable, and therefore they don't recycle into the earth. This is the home on which we live, the continents. So, what is what is the what is distribution of ocean ages? The distribution of ocean ages is shown here with colors, and you can see that the oldest oceans one finds a small bit here. Ocean revenue is is about two eighty. That's about the limit. There are no ocean flows on the surface of the globe which are more aged than that, and we now know the reason why because they do keep on getting recycled, unlike the continents, which will, because they are unsinkable, remain high, fortunately for us, because they offer us a boat. So this is another test. I have a passion for tests of hypotheses. So, uh, and I thought that I shouldn't go away from this lecture giving you uh, you know, very nice folklore, but uh, something which is hard in science. So here again is, a, is an experiment that if magma comes here like this, magma rises here, here is a magma ocean, and this thing is splits, that is how the isotherms are going to look like, right? And you have these columns of, of sea flow, which is for quenching here and, and solidifying, which will move away from here so one can do a mathematical analysis of the whole thing. And then ask the question that as the ocean flow recedes, it's going to cool and thicken. And therefore, there'll be more water there above it than over the younger ones. For the simple reason that at some depth, the weight of all the columns must be the same. Hydrostatic equilibrium. And it turns out that applying this thermal diffusion theory, um, one comes to this figure that the, that the thickness of the ocean, sorry, the water, uh, the depth of the water will be under root, uh, square root, proportional to square root of the time. So that's again testable. And scientists were quick to have dredged rocks dredged from the ocean floor and put them to radioactive uh, dating, which is which is quite uh, I mean, re reasonably accurate. Again, not a fairy tale, and 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 show this curve. So th those dots are observations. The curve is the theory, and here again one can see the close coincidence between what is predicted by the Fourier analysis and I mean Fourier heat analysis and what the observations have been found. There could be more, but I have to go further. So I must stop and uh, some of you might ponder over it uh, because it will be available here. And we go on to ask another question. Why didn't it happen on Venus and Mars? They are the two planets which are so close to us. And Venus is so similar, it's almost considered as a twin to us. So why didn't it happen on Venus, why didn't it happen on Mars? And, uh, and we find this answer, that the thickness of the upper lid, the boundary layer, is extremely critical to this whole business of plate tectonics. Make it a bit thinner, and it will be, it will be sort of ruptured by the ascending magma in such a manner. You have a question? 
in such a manner that a coherent plate capable of recycling will not develop. Make it too thick, and it will be a single plate panel. So, how do we know that? Uh, what is the factor responsible for this? So, here is a picture that is based on experimental analysis done by geochemists who showed that uh, the melting curve uh, lowers at a given pressure if you go on adding more water to it. So if there are water in the interstitial crystal structure, it lowers the melting point. And because it lowers the melting point, the under the thermal gradient of the Earth, the equilibrium temperature being determined by the equality of radiation from the solar heat, and that radiated according to Stevens' law, and the interior. And that will tell us as to, as to where, how thick this will be, if we allow for the fact that the, the melting point is going to go, is going to be lowered if it has more water. So if you're going adding, if you go on adding more and more water to the minerals, which is an experimental result, um, you find that the melting point curve comes down from there to there. This is the thermodynamic curve that you will otherwise find. And this is what happens if you have liquid in it. So because of this, the, if, you, if that is the, this is the liquid solid interface and up to here, the material will be cold and brittle and below it, it will become viscoelastic. And just at the interface, it will become molten. So here is a solid material with a molten interface overlying a viscous material. It's mechanically uncoupled from all the motion that will take it. So that's, that's the trick. It didn't happen on Mars for the reason I told you. It didn't happen on Venus because the surface is just too hot. Uh, not because it is a little closer to the sun, only 10% closer than we are, but because the carbon dioxide atmosphere of Venus keeps the surface very warm because of this uh, water effect, the greenhouse effect. So we, we have some circumstantial evidence, not a QED, but circumstantial evidence that the that presence of water played a great role in making sure that the upper lid has just the right thickness to engineer plate tectonics. If it were a little thinner, it wouldn't happen. If it were a little thicker, it didn't happen. And hence, our, it's a Goldilocks plan. And you'll ask, well, maybe there's not water in space where Venus is, but there is. And we have these uh, messengers from the from space in the form of meteorites. And we have always found that there is presence of water. Uh, it is ubiquitous in the universe, but if it is bound with this structure of hydrated silicates. So it's not fanciful to, Im to imagine that there were water everywhere, but just those planets were unable to assimilate it if for one reason or the other. And, and that's why this circumstance mission didn't happen. So this is the picture of what would happen on Venus, for example. Uh, the, the, the lithosphere would never become strong enough to be able to, to do this recycling. And unless you re do recycling, uh, like what is happening on Earth, things won't happen. And now, just a sentence to say that it is recycling that connects the surface of the Earth with its center that is not in too small a measure responsible for the emergence of life and various other phenomena on Earth. So I'll now come to the Himalayas. And this is the, this is the picture of the Earth from 150 billion years. And you can see where India was here, a part of this uh, agglomerate here sitting over Antarctica because plate tectonic movements had piled up these continents into, into at this stage, into two different agglomerations, one resting on the South Pole and the other further north. And at some stage, because continents are bad insulators, bad conductors of heat, the radiogenic heat 
directly underneath. It became, be, began accumulating to the point where the rocks were melted. And once they were melted to the point that they couldn't stay here, they rose up and started cracking the corners, rifting them apart. And the corners rifted apart. And once they start rifting, and this high density material comes over here, somehow, you know, it starts, it's because of its own momentum, it keeps it expanding, pushing the coordinates on the other side. And you can see that what happens here. So this is India. There's a vast ocean that lies on its north over here. This is at 120 million years. And where is India? India is here now. And you can see this part chasm has already opened. Madagascar is still attached to India. And this part is opening up. At 83, India has traveled quite far, began being pushed very fast. Big question, why? We don't know the answer. It moved as fast as about 15 centimeters a year. And by the time it arrived close to its northern conglomeration, continents, lower density, the, the two lower density materials, one will find it a little difficult to sub, sub up. Then, so this is at 83. At 80, India is here. At 70, you see it has moved to far. 40, it is already here. Uh, face to face with this low density continental material, they are crumpling the oceans. They are crumpling the ocean in between. They they sort of dive the ocean in between into the earth and crumpling the rocks now, and fracturing and crumpling, and becoming thicker and making Tibet. So this is the long march, about eighty million years that this began to happen. This was in eighty million year long march of India, of, of the Indian continent, to travel north to create this fantastic landform, which has many endowments that are critical to us, water, weather, the great diversity, and so on. And you will ask, why do I keep on flaunting these figures, 10 centimeter, this and that? Well, actually, one can calculate it. One can calculate it because from the flipping, of the polarities. And from the rocks on the continent, which can also be dated by radioactive dating, one can calculate as to what time of the past the magnetic field was normal and when it was reversed. So when we find alternating strips here of normal and reversed, we take their widths, which scientists can measure, and the time from the geochronology of reversals, and thus get the velocity. So here is a direct way of getting the velocity of, uh, of uh, diverging ocean. And there's a test here, another test I put forward here for your curiosity. We see that there, are, there is a, there's a rising limb here, or old one, another one here, here. And this forms a triple junction. Now, those interested in dynamics would, would easily see that this triple junction can only be stable under certain conditions. Firstly, of course, the angles must have sum up to 360 degrees. They do, in fact, they have been measured. And, and some other conditions. So that's another test which I could have added to the list. So this is the moment of India. <clears throat> and pushed by, by the Indian Ocean, being created at the back in the chasm that was left after it moved to Antarctica. And this is how it moved and eventually collided with Asia. And you can see the result of the way it has been collided. Now, an amazing thing begins to happen here. Indian continent, by virtue of some past history, was more stolid than the continent in which it ran. And it was able to underthrust that. And India began diving under threat. So we say all this with some confidence, because in the meantime, a model has been produced by somebody I'll show. And it was actually tested by uh, a former student of mine who worked at Cambridge, uh, who 
who used seismological rays to, to image this and found the Indian continent underlying La Sahet, about 80 kilometers. So I'll have occasion to show this to you. So that is how it happened. And this picture that is shown here as to how India is thrusting over here is, is actually proved now in reality. I put a star there to show that as this leading edge of India under thrust debate, it goes deeper and deeper, and therefore encounters higher and higher temperature domain. And therefore, its rheology changes as it goes deeper. So the entire thing is being is under compression, pushed by the Indian Ocean on the one side, and from the north, some other extant ocean. So it's being compressed, and therefore something must happen to overcome this compression, go up one side, should go up the other. But on doing so, part of the journey is viscous and the other part is elastic. So what will happen is that this thing will keep pushing until, and, and, and the forward thing cannot move because it's elastically, you know, friction locked there. So a lot of energy will accumulate there until it can slip the whole thing forward. It can't do anything else because it's, it's brittle. And uh, through some other means, it has been shown that there is no slip that is accommodated as viscous slip. It's all elastic. So you will have to take my word for it because it will have to be another lecture to, to show all the evidence that it is indeed so. So, so what happens is that over here, all these strains is accumulating. And until this whole thing slips, that means a big earthquake, this will keep giving little squeaks. And we have, have a locus of earthquakes all along this very narrow belt. And that was again discovered by my co-workers a uh, long, long time ago. The first such result in the Himalayas. <clears throat> so that's another uh, evidence. And, and that's shown here, all these earthquakes, you know, along that line, if you extend it underneath, uh, all the way over there. So this was the model suggested by Argon, very prescient mind. And uh, as I told you earlier, my student tested it by using uh, very precise uh, uh, tomography and showed that here, this, here is where the Indian plate now is, and it's about 80 kilometers under Lhasa. So, so that was that. And uh, so what else can we say about the physics of the Himalaya? We know that these are old ruptures. Those dates are given there. And the length shows that that part of the Himalaya ruptured. The north of that part of the Himalaya slid over the south in a gigantic leap. When that happens, we call, we call it uh, the Great Earthquake. And the energy released in that great earthquake can easily be calculated because it is equal to the work done in moving. So it is equal to the area multiplied by the slip, multiplied by the coefficient of rigidity, and that gives you the energy. And seismologists convert it into what is known as the magnetic is seismic moment because it's actually uh, a tensor. And the waveforms that we measure will allow us, do, does allow us today to actually calculate those moment tenses. And once we calculate it, then we can say, well, which direction it moved. So that is how the fault plane solutions are, are produced. So uh, at some stage, you know, I was persuaded to uh, move to an office job in Delhi. And, but after three years, I insisted I, should, I must leave before I burn out. And uh, when I went back to Bangalore, I said, uh, I uh, started asking this question. Uh, Strains is accumulating here. There's convergence of two areas, Tibet and India. What is the rate? And what, what was the thought behind this question? The thought was that we roughly know the strength at which, the strain at which rocks fracture which is about 10 to the minus four. That means if you have a, a 10 kilometer strip, if you compress it by one meter, it's bound to slip. 
take away a fraction here and there, but that's roughly it. If I know what is the rate at which it is being compressed, then I can calculate that if the last earthquake or this happened then, when would it be ready for the next one? So that was the thought behind the question. And uh, in a very difficult situation, because the defense would not let me use GPS in Himalaya, um, we somehow managed to do it. Uh, this is showing, you know, how how the shortening is taking place because geolog geologists have mapped it. So this is something which is mapped by geologists. It doesn't tell you how it has happened, but it shows that it has happened. And the question I'm big, I'm trying to answer is how has this happened and at what rate? So uh, I'll quickly pass this. I put some physics there to show how do they become high in the first place. And then another, another physics here. Uh, what keeps some areas on the earth high? And that's the hydrostatic balance because the rheology changes and wherever you have viscous material, under stress is going to flow. So you can't put a 21 kilometer mountain here because in the earth at 100 kilometer, there's viscous material and it starts flowing. On Mars, you can do that because the crust is so thick. The, the, the layer is so, so thick. So, and that was actually found uh, by some British mathematicians in the 19th century, just by, by looking at the plumb lines at two places, Himalaya and a place another slightly distant from it. And they found that these two plumb lines, which they could measure very accurately in relation to the stars, were not parallel. They should ideally be parallel if they were vertical. But one of them was attracted towards the Himalayas. And they were curious enough to be able to calculate what is the density of the Himalaya was known. So you can calculate the mass of the Himalaya by uh, taking the topography, dissecting it into little prisms, vertical prisms, calculating the effect of all the prisms, gravity effect, their attraction, add them together, and they found that it was not enough. It should have attracted more, the, the divergence should have been more than and then came the theory of isostasy that the Himalayas are standing there because they also strike deep roots. So the same low density material extends far deeper. And what should have been the extra deflection is made up by the lack of uh, material down there. So that comes by isostasy. I thought I put that here. <clears throat> so we measured this. This is GPS and this is space based triangulation. So the bottom line is what we found that if I went, some of you might know, for example, where uh, Dehradun is and, uh, and where Kedardant is. So if I, if I put a, if I measure the movement at Dehradun with respect to uh, one in Bangalore where I put my reference station, I find that it is about one or two millimeters per year. One or two millimeters in 2000 kilometers. If I go, 70 or 80 kilometers further north, I find it to be about 14, 15 millimeters per year. So here's the picture. Very surprising when it came that this thing, Tibet, is driving over India at the rate of about 14 to 18 millimeters. Average is about 40, 15. But over here, currently at many places, it is zero. So all the, and if this was what happened at the last time the earthquake took place, where it unsprung the whole thing, it has since been, since the last earthquake, is compressing this spring. And one day, this will happen, a big earthquake. So this is the mechanism. This was, this mechanism was explained by an American scientist, not us. We had provided the data. So this is the this is the convergence rate, and you see it becomes almost almost zero here. So and exactly where that gradient is all the earthquakes, because that is where it is accumulated. And south of that region, the material is locked, and 
This is the locked zone width, which has been determined by numbers that that is the ratio of the average slip at that point divided by the whole slip. So that will tell us the coefficient of friction because if it was equal to the whole slip, it should be it should be zero, otherwise one. And one sees that indeed that model uh, fits well. And we now see this is a rupture plane which has been mapped on from the earthquake waves that that were. Uh, that were analyzed after the advent of the Nepal earthquake, and they demanded this kind of a rupture plane. We can see that here is the plane is coming. There is nothing here. This is constantly slipping. So there is no fracture there. The fracture is here, but stopped here and created a strain zone over here. Why did it stop? Because the surface is not exactly dipping. There's a little flexure there, and there wasn't enough energy to to go past it, but one day it will be, and the whole thing will break again because it can't go anywhere else if it is being pushed from behind. Because, because this way it increases, an earthquake releases the strain, goes up again. And if we know this, and we know this level, which is about 10 to the minus four, we can tell as to when the next earthquake will be. So here's a little computer simulation. So put Tibet, see what is happening as Tibet is riding over India. So formation of elastic strain in the first, you see how the strain is building in that region. Eventually it will slip. Eventually it slips and all the strain is relieved. Okay. You see how that region had flexed up elastically, storing the potential energy. But when it could do no more, then the slip took place. So this is uh, this is the model of the Himalaya. Thank you, pardon. Oh, where am I going? So that's the model of the Himalaya, which shows how Tibet is coming through successive fracture systems over India, and how at this point, all this strain builds up because of the change in rheology and the transition from viscous sliding to, to elastic yeah. creep over there, elastic uh, locking. Right, so one can calculate on the basis of those numbers of convergence, and now there are hundreds of GPS there, which bring us a lot of data, and, and uh, one analyzes, and one can keep confirming that the velocity with which the northern part is coming is so much, and how it peters down to zero towards the front, and and then calculating how much energy has already been released by all the small moderate earthquakes that I have in the in the interim, one can say how much is remaining there. So that's what this exercise has done. It tells us how much is remaining there in here. So those are the strain limits that exist uh, in the region. Of course, here, eastern Nepal, you can see it's been released, but over here, the risks are still high. There, there, and there. So this is what we have been, I've been talking about, trying to explain why these earthquakes accumulate here. We didn't have an answer for this when we discovered it in 1980. We didn't have an answer why it should be there. And Terry Dam was being built and we had no clue as to what this is telling us. Now we know this is strain accumulation zone because it is the interseismic is the interrheological zone between viscous slipping and so you must have noticed that I've been describing a lot of things, few tests here and there, but no great, uh, no great theoretical framework to explain all this, which could uh, answer this. Can we visualize what will happen to Himalayan? 
can we predict? Uh, so, I attempt to visualize. Uh, one knows now that a fracture zone is appearing here, incipient fracture zone in the Indian Ocean. And I suspect that what's going to happen is that there have been a few earthquakes also over here, and this has been mapped by marine geologists, marine geophysicists. So if that happens, what is going to happen here that this ocean floor, instead of pushing whole, the whole corner is going to go under here. If this happens to be heavier than that part of the ocean, if this go, go, happens to be heavier, it will also, that will go down above this. But the contraction will take place here and the pushing of the Himalaya will stop. And the Himalaya, if nothing is pushing up, then that potential energy is eventually going to bring it down. Weather is always at work to make sure that it's eroded. And as it's eroded and its thickness decreases, this viscous material will start bringing it up and up till all of it is eroded. So this is the fate of the Himalaya. Can we predict it? No, because we don't have this. We don't have a unified way to explain it. Uh, recently, uh, a bright young man at Indian Institute of Science has been doing convection modeling, and he's brought some results which beg for an answer, and I've shared it with some uh, of you here. And I believe it can be answered by bringing in four different scientific endeavors from different areas. Uh, this is a this is the neutrino tomography. That's convection modeling. This is density function theory. And this is the normal mode of the Earth, which is akin to what is being done by heliocyte models. So if we can somehow bring these together, we apparently have expertise, good expertise for this in uh, Indian Institute of Science. We have somebody here who can mentor this work, Shavan, and we've been trying to we have a good expertise here in the, currently in the SN Bose Institute of Calcutta. We might have some possibilities here. If we feel this, there could be some chance of doing, uh, of, of doing this important thing over here. I should like to say that, that the revolutionary theory of plate tectonics, uh, it owes a great deal to this man called Rutherford. He was the first person to apply a quantitative method to an earth science problem, and that was to date this sample of pitch blend uh, and get this age of 700 million years. That was the first credible age uh, in numbers produced by a scientific method of which we had a theory. And he was the author of it, he was a physicist. And his two nuclear physicists, Patrick Bullard and this, laid the foundation of what would explain the reversal of the magnetic fields and also this oceans, the congruent faces of the oceans here. I leave you to read that. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, a question for you? Yeah, so you said uh, here. Here. Yeah. So, yeah. So you said that uh, you predict that the fate of the Himalayas would be to kind of go down and so on. Well, what is the time scale that can you predict a time scale for this to happen? And what sort of order of magnitude time scale are we talking about? It would be in million years. Yeah. yeah. But you can take a mathematical model which will uh -huh. use the numerical values, the materials yeah. there. We can scale it down. Yeah. In terms of non-dimensional quantities, yeah. you know, that so, kind of scale. Yeah. So some attempts can be made. It's, I mean, scientifically, it's not a, it's not a problem, you know, we can throw your money. Mm -hmm. 
I believe I could. I I I hope I'm not too wrong. So does all the stored energy get released only in the in, in earthquakes, or is there some heating involved? The some the, the energy of this collision. Yeah. Does it only get released as earthquakes, or is there some heating involved because uh, things are pushing against each other? There will be some frictional heating, certainly. Okay. Is that measurable? Uh, but that frictional heat, being near the surface, it will dissipate easily. Some of it might penetrate to the surface. Well, sorry, to the subsurface and do something to the rocks there. And that too is something, you know, for which mathematically we can get some estimates. But all these things are doable, provided we we do it in the in a quantitative manner. But surely that and fracturing, and of course it's not a it's the slip itself brings about a tremendous amount of you know devastation in the material, fracturing the material. So all those individual, you know, explosions will also. Yeah. Yes, I was going to lead to know whether such measurements, if possible, would help you. Bit in better understanding what's going to happen. Which measurement? The measurements of this heat, extra heat that is uh, getting produced, whether that can help you in prediction of what's going to happen in the near future. Sure. So that's how one would go about. One will first say how much energy was released just by that slip. And then one would make an estimate of how much energy might have gone into making fragments, which will be on the surface. And the balance one would you know, balance always we put in entropy's basket. Yeah, so you compared the mountains of Mars to the, those of Earth, right? So uh, my question is regarding those of Venus with that of Earth. So if you said that Venus has a thinner plastic uh, crust. So how does it support mountains taller than, than that of Earth? I mean, is, is it... Sorry, can you repeat that? Which so basically, you? Venus has mountains taller than um, Everest, basically, and uh, it has a thinner crust. So is, is erosion at play here, or are there other factors related to... No, you're talking about Mars. No, Venus, Venus. So there are mountains on Venus taller than that on Earth. So... Mountains on Venus yeah. are taller than that on Earth. Yeah, so you you said that the, the thickness of the crust matters, right, to support yeah. that weight. So uh, why does a, it have taller mountains? Despite they are, they are having... supported by the plastic crust or the up. To... Yes, the viscous. Okay. Crust. Yeah. So erosion is not at play here. I mean, because uh... how they are sustained there, I don't think we have. No, the growth the... versus the uh, breaking down. That was ever what I was asking. Is erosion important in, in Venus. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure because I yeah, so it's not happens, important, right? It doesn't rain there, and rain is one of the main uh, factors. Okay. Erosion. Hey, very nice talk. I'm, I'm, I must apologize. I did give you a satisfactory answer. Think about it. Uh, <clears throat> I believe uh, when you test these models, you have taken into account the previous events, uh, earthquake, large earthquake events. Uh, when you do these modeling, what's the question? Have you taken into account previous earthquakes when you do the forward model? Absolutely. Yeah. So Absolutely. we do it. We take historical account, the best that we can do. All the historical accounts that are available and estimate from those historical accounts and the effects observed at distance from the region. From We take all that into account to make an estimate of what the energy, what the magnitude of the earthquake would have been. So, how precisely can you predict the next big one in terms of number of years? Yeah, we cannot predict earthquakes. I must underline cannot. Uh, you know, in physics, we have uh, we have seen many phenomena in the physical world, which we describe as critical point phenomena, uh, and there is no physics that we have today that can explain to us as to what happens exactly at that critical point. Um, there are attempts and there are approaches, but exactly, for example, you take water to 0 0.00009 degrees, pure water under ideal, it will not freeze. But 
exact zero, it will suddenly freezes. And it freezes not just at one place, it freezes in the entire, there's, as if there's a long distance communication. Something takes over at that critical point, but we can do one thing. Uh, we can statistically show what is the probability that something will happen. So statistical physics allows you to give a probability, but not the exact time and where it will happen. There's a famous experiment called the sand pile experiment, where you know we go on dropping grains of sand at one point, and it will grow into a cone. And when it grows into a critical shape, then what of the next grains, and one, can't, one can never tell when, even on a computer experiment, there may be, there will be small slides, and at one point there may be a big slide. So in critical phenomena, that's the limitation we have. We cannot predict, but we can estimate the probability of the occurrence. And that's not unimportant. Because if I told you that the probability of occurrence of a big earthquake is 50 years, is enough time for you to put your house in order and make sure, okay, if the earthquake comes, we will cope with it. Engineers today are capable of designing a building which will withstand any level of ground acceleration, provided the ground itself does not fail. That means you're not, you not building on mud, as happened in Joshima. So given that, that we can design it, if you tell us what is the maximum ground acceleration, that estimate is not valueless. To give the probability limit that the maximum acceleration you, you can expect is this, taking into account all the uncertainties of magnitudes and other and this is what one does. One produces a hazard, quantitative hazard map on the basis of this, where every point is characterized by the probability with which the ground acceleration will not exceed a given limit over a given period of time. If our engineers and policymakers would heed this, then earthquakes can come and go and nothing will happen. It lets it pass. Hello, yeah, very nice talk. Uh, what I wanted to ask was, is there any interesting geomagnetic behavior in the Himalayas? Any geomagnetic behavior, any observations? Magnetic effects, magnetic observations, magnetism in the Himalayas, rocks or the soil or the ground of the Himalayas. There are, you know, the magnetic field of the earth is largely dipolar, but it has many multiples. I don't know the details of where those multipolar centers exist, but they certainly are over because it's very largely dipolar, but not entirely. They're quadrupoles, they're octopoles, and they will arise because of these local inhomogeneity, you know, local inclusions of matter. Uh, but over the Himalaya, there would be a permanent magnetic effect distinct from what is being produced by the geodynamo of the mass itself, because it has more magnetite than the surrounding region. But that will not be unexpected. Yeah, so I was wondering if uh, the Himalayan plate that's going underneath the Tibetan plate if there is yet another plate, you know, underneath the Himalayan plate, and if these two plates are chemically similar to each other, and if you know, there is some way of uh, testing that. So my question is that we talk no, about. I get your question. So we know the Himalayan plate, the Indian plate, because you, we are sitting here. If you go near Haridwar, you know, you will know. You can, you can do the. Okay, we so we don't. Want to, and if you see the integrity of the same plate over there, then you know this is the same plate. So essentially, you know, what you will say is that the elastic constant then say, et cetera, mm -hmm. of this material is similar to that. And therefore one assumes circumstantially. No, but my question is that the top of the Tibetan uh, plate and yeah. something underneath the Himalayan plate should be similar. No? Like, so the Himalayan plate should be sandwiched between two Tibetan the Himalayan plate is diving down because remember that India had an oceanic apron in front of it, which has already gone down. 
Okay, it kept sliding because of its heavier density very easily. It kept sliding for 80 million years. And said, what's underneath the Himalayan plate? Just no, so what is Himalaya? So let me explain to you. So here the Indian plate going down. Mm -hmm. Okay. The apron has already gone and this continent has pushed itself because it happened to be more stolid. Okay. And looked at from Tibet, it is coming as a bulldozer. So what does a bulldozer do? It makes a wedge by scraping off the material and by that's what has happened. And the Himalaya is a wedge. Thanks. It's a shaved off material from the undergoing Indian plate piled up over here in layers to make it. So the geology of Himalayas, the geology of the Indian plate, surface of the Indian plate. It is, yeah. Uh, if I may, that's a more question we take this. I have a question myself. Uh, in this business of prediction, Okay, with the probability distribution of the earthquakes in the region of uh, the Himalayas, uh, are there enough, uh, you know, instruments which make measurements and it's enough to do a reasonable job of the prediction or is there a need of more instrumentation? I believe that we can improve all the estimations mm -hmm. and the characterization of material depth that we have made, we can improve it a great deal mm -hmm. by multiplying the instrument tenfold. Tenfold, I see. Not difficult to do. Well, what would be the India part? has dumped more money than that into, into seed. Uh, well, how, how expensive would that be? One instrument, one seismometer costs about 10 lakhs. Okay, so that's not much. Eight or nine lakhs. Okay. Ten lakhs. So, the GPS issue was also possible. So that. the order of 10 crore or something would be enough to put enough instrumentation yeah. there to... Mm -hmm. Okay, any other question? If not, then let's thank the speaker for... Yeah. On behalf of the asset Pilokium, I have the privilege of presenting you with this, as well as the book on the theater afterwards. So, thank you very much indeed. Oh, to hold yeah. it again. <laughs> no, Fortunately, no, I guess. <laughs> no, really. Okay. So, you have to make And this, of course, tea. will be greatly treasured because I love art. Thank you very much. Yeah, so thanks. Thanks once again, all of you. Thanks very much for a fantastic talk today. Uh, please join us for a cup of tea in the West Canteen. Sorry. I...